Good afternoon. It's uh, Friday, April the 14th, 2017, and we're here at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. My name is David Laws. I'm semiconductor curator here at the museum, and we're going to interview Marv Rudin about his uh, career and life in Silicon Valley. Um, and so let's get started, Marv. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, where you were born and something about your childhood? Well, I wasn't born in Silicon Valley, so my life outside of Silicon Valley started in Glendale, California, <laughs> still in California. And uh, uh, actually, we didn't live there. Uh, we lived in the north end of Los Angeles, but uh, the hospital was in Glendale, the White Memorial Hospital. And uh, uh, my parents, after a couple of years, moved to a place that was was busy, one of the biggest, busiest streets in Los Angeles called Fletcher Drive. And, uh, and my mother put a, my dad was working for the uh, police, Los Angeles police, and uh, to make extra money, this was in, this was back in, uh, just past 1929, and there was a crash, and so people needed more money, and my mother put up a market in front of our house. And when I, later on, when I was only seven, I was selling papers out on this busy corner of San Fernando Road, which was the, the north-south road to San Francisco from Los Angeles, and then it was the highway. There were, there were no freeways, <laughs> none, no freeways. And, uh, and, and then uh, other notable things was, or that, I broke a leg with my uh, neighbor, uh, who was uh, quite a sports guy, uh, Kenny McTaggart, up in the hills, the Verdugo Hills nearby, and uh, that got patched up, of course. And, and then at 13, I had an appendicitis and was in the hospital. And, but the big thing came when I was, I had just turned, no, I was just about to turn 15. When I was 14, World War II started. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. It was a big shock. And I was selling papers in Glendale at, at the um, drugstore there. That I believe it was Thrifty Drug. Or it might have been Sontag. Anyway, uh, it was a big shock. And people were, it wasn't like today where you'd hear about it right away. Uh, people were asking what happened. And, and I couldn't tell if it was in the newspaper. <laughs> it, had, it had been printed. The, day, the night before, but uh, I had to come home to find out that on the radio that we'd been attacked at Pearl Harbor. Okay, then uh, luckily uh, I, when I was in, uh, in the, what was it, the first grade, there was a big earthquake, which wasn't lucky for the people who withstood it, but it shook down our school in the middle of the night and uh, they had a shortage of uh, classrooms and they had these, these tented type that they used in the military with wooden foundation and a tent top. And they, they couldn't find a space for me in my class so they moved me ahead. And I managed to do enough, well enough in uh, the early addition to, to survive in that. So I was up a half a grade. Well that was a benefit later because when that war started uh, uh, later on, it was still going, and uh, in 1944, I went to, I got into Caltech. Oh, by the way, when I got into Caltech, I, uh, I didn't know that it was going to be so hard, so I only applied there. And it turns out, I got to learn later, that there were 350 qualified kids, it was boys only then, so qualified boys. Who, who were uh, authorized through their high school record. And they only were gonna take 50 because Caltech was, I didn't know this, but they were almost all full with, with Navy V-12, it was called, Navy V-12 program. And so they only taken 50 for the freshman class. And, uh, and uh, luckily I managed to get in. Was so what, what year was that when you graduated? That was uh, 1944, when I graduated from, from Franklin High. From Franklin and, High in Oh yeah, at Franklin High, I forgot to mention. Right. At Franklin High, I, I, I was uh, 
I wrote a column for the sports page uh, and because the editor of the sports page didn't want to write it anymore and he asked me to do it. I took journalism at the time and, and, then, uh, uh, and then also uh, I guess that made me notable there and so I ran for office for, for the Boys League president and the Boys League at that time was a sexist outfit <laughs> that, uh, that held uh, assemblies only for boys and there was another one for girls for the Girls League. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and so that was practice of me for public speaking that I'm not doing so well right now. But, but uh, you're doing fine, Mark. <laughs> uh, in terms of the school, what did you enjoy doing at school? Particular subjects, math, I presume, based on yeah, I was good career. at math. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of goes back when I was in the fifth grade. I was walking home, and I remember thinking that day that there, something had transpired on the, up at the, I was up at the board on the chalkboard and it seemed like I was the only one in the class who understood, I can't remember what it was, but it, I was the only one who seemed to understand it right away. Mm -hmm. And so I was walking back and I was thinking, nobody ever told me that some people are smarter than others. I just thought all kids are about equal. And, and at that time I thought, I wonder why they didn't get what I got. And then gradually I began to see, like in junior high, they used to give us math quizzes when we, before we came into class, uh, when we first came into class. And, and for five minutes, the first, there was a five minute rule and you had to solve all the problems in five minutes and submit them. They were mainly just arithmetic. And uh, in fact, yeah, they were all arithmetic. And, and if you could get it done and in five minutes and they were all correct, then you've got a star or whatever. At the end of, this, end of the semester, I was far ahead of other, the other people and I, I won it almost every day, probably did every day. So uh, then I began to realize there is a difference, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and then it became more apparent in high school when I went to Franklin High, uh, high school was three years and junior high was three years. And when I went to uh, Franklin, uh, and I had, a, I had an older brother, three years older than myself, and he was there for a half year, uh, and so there, he had a car, so we didn't, it was three miles away, so anyway, I went with him. When I got to Franklin, uh, in my very first English class, I was quite sure that several girls there were doing better than I was, but at midterm, the teacher said, I'm only giving one A out, and it's Marvin Rudin. And I, almost, and I was reading a book, which I normally don't do, but I just did it because there was time to kill while she graded. And, and I just about floor, fell off my chair. I couldn't believe it. Uh, and, and then gradually, as time went on, I kept getting A's and A's. And, I, and ultimately, I graduated first in the class. Good. Uh, Scholastically, sure. Was there a particular, any particular teachers that encouraged you in one subject or another, or were you? Hmm. Or were there members? Yeah, yeah. Hitchcock, yeah. in the fifth grade, wanted to advance me another half year. Okay. And uh, I and my parents decided that I wasn't physically mature enough mm -hmm. to uh, be in a class a whole year advanced. But now, but I think maybe I should have because it would have gotten me another, gotten me out of Caltech even sooner. <laughs> well, it doesn't seem to hurt you too much, Marvel, along yeah. the way. So, yeah. so good. So you applied to Caltech in? So I applied in uh, Caltech in 1944, and then I went in the Navy, and uh, I was in the Navy for a year and a half. Well, and why did I go in the Navy? Because half of our class, nearly 24, all enlisted in the Navy for the Eddy program, which was going to teach us to be electronic technicians for the ed, Navy. Ed, e, 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 D, D, y. E, D, D, y. Okay. And uh, we were going to be electronic technicians, and they needed them because there were new things that people who knew, like ham and all that, couldn't handle, namely radar and sonar. And those that was those were big things for the war. Mm -hmm. Important things. Good, okay, so you uh, applied to the Navy and you were enrolled in the Eddy program? 
Yeah, I, I, I enrolled in the uh, the Eddy program that was to teach us electronic uh, electronics for the Navy. They're kind of electronics, and uh, and the, the way it worked was we first had to go to boot camp. Everybody who goes into the Navy goes in boot camp first, for maybe for no good reason, but they do, and uh, that's the way they do it. And so I. Uh, in the company where I was with, my great buddy from Caltech uh, was uh, B uh, Bill Bittner, and he's, he had gone in too, but he didn't appear on the train that took us all to Chicago and to Great Lakes Naval Training Center where we went to the boot camps. And, and I was really upset about that that he wasn't there because we were really close. And, and, and then, um, but in, in any case, then I, I didn't have a buddy in the boot camp. So, so I just went, after we were off on weekends, I just go up to the recreation um, center and, uh, and they said they were having a ping pong tournament. Well, I'd played a lot of ping pong both at Caltech and also before Caltech. So I was fairly good at it. We used to play for money. <laughs> so you had, to, you had to be good because you didn't have much money. So, so anyway, I, I entered and uh, there were 2,000 men in the boot camp, I learned later. But I managed to win that very first tournament. Uh, and the guy I was playing uh, he won the first game. We had to win two games out of three. And he won the first game easily. I struggled, but barely won the second game. And in the third game, it was, the game was 21, and, and he, he was ahead 20 to 15. And I said to myself, I'm going to throw caution to the wind, and I'm just going to whack every ball, <laughs> try to kill every shot. And I did seven in a row. <laughs> I've never done that before or since, and won the tournament. Good for you. Good yeah, for you. and then after that, there was a tournament every week. Some little guy came up to me and at, after I'd won, and he beat me. And then for the next four weeks, he beat me at the, in the finals. And then he left, <laughs> and I won again, and so, <laughs> so I, won, I won four out of six. Good for you. What kind and, of... And, and then, I went into, yeah. then I tried boxing as well. And, and, uh, and I'd never boxed before, and I was scared to death on the first bout because the other guy had knocked out somebody the week before. And I put my arms up, you know, to shield, and, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to show him I'm not afraid of him. So I, I went over as he came out of his corner, and I started punching him early. And it turned out it was an easy fight because it turned out I had a reach on him. And, and I just put my left into him and I didn't bat well and I said, I'm not gonna back up because I saw this other kid back up and he got knocked out of the ring. Mm. <laughs> so, so I didn't back up. I, so I quickly came up with a strategy and it won for me. Good. And, uh, and from then on, I didn't lose a fight. I had one draw. Good. Yeah, so that, I mean, that was really <laughs> thrilling, you know, because I'd never done these things. Probably never would have I had, if I hadn't gone in the Navy. And, and then well, they, what did they teach you at the boot camp? What, was there any electronic training there? Or well, one of them was to recognize physics? Japanese planes. Oh, I see. <laughs> for one thing, no, no electronics. No, electronics no, no. So this is a general boot camp for. I see. Yeah. Well, these were special people. The ones we had in our company, they were from Yale, Harvard. You know, uh, you know, the creme de creme mentally, mm -hmm. and they and they gave us some kind of a Navy IQ test. And I didn't score highest than that. Mm. <laughs> the guy from Yale did, and a Jewish guy from Yale. <laughs> and but anyway, uh, yeah, I did all right, but not like some of them. Right. And and uh, yeah, yeah. The, so the Navy finally discharged us, and uh, and some of us were sent to uh, what they called uh, pre was it pre radio, I think, and. Uh, and that was, uh, one of them was in Chicago. They took over a high school that was on California Street in Chicago, I remember. 
don't remember the name of it, but they took it over and for the Navy, and uh, and it was a great chance to go out and have fun when we weren't studying, and we were heroes in in Chicago in World War II, you know. In the coast, there's more sailors and whatnot, but in Chicago, a uniform was everything. <laughs> I found out. So I had a lot of good times there. It was only about, I'm not sure, it might have been four or six weeks, uh-huh. and then uh, and then we went to, uh, and then I got oh, and I had a chance to go visit uh, relatives in Ashtabula, Ohio, that I probably never would have seen otherwise, and, and get into a strange place in the Midwest. And then ultimately, uh, I got sent to uh, uh, to uh, Treasure Island here in the Bay. Okay. And uh, and that's when all the by that time. Oh, I forgot to mention the war was the war was was now over. Um, when let's see. Um, wait a minute. No, I'm I'm wrong. First, we went to uh, to Del Monte, California. Where they, were, they had the Hotel Del Monte, always in. Uh, the Hotel Del Monte was in Monterey. Monterey, it's yeah. in Monterey, right? I'm sorry, not not Del Monte, but it's the Del Monte Hotel. And um, I I remember while we were there, one of my classmates from Caltech, just by chance, who flunked out, by the way, he never was allowed to come back, but he but he he came through the lobby and he said. Hey everybody! Guess what? He said they dropped this big bomb in in Japan, and the war is going to be over quickly. <laughs> he didn't even know what it was. He didn't right. know it was an atom bomb. You know. Sure, it's a couple of huge bombs. And and uh, anyway, so and we used to go out to the. It was kind of interesting. We went out. They they used the stables for electronic labs. Um, the stables by the polo field there at Del Monte. And uh, we used to march to Colonel Grundy. That was, <laughs> if you know that march. And and they used to sing, Worship, it makes the grass grow green. <laughs> <laughs> and like that. And then we went up to Treasure Island for the final schooling. Okay. And there we saw huge amounts of sailors coming back, uh, and Marines coming back from the war. And also we saw an interesting thing, uh, German captives from the, the, the um, Africa Corps, and they were the cream of the crop, I guess. They were all like over six feet, and they all marched in rhythm beautifully and they served in the scullery, dishing out the food. Mm-hmm. And then us, us uh, eggheads <laughs> would, would be marching like stragglers, you know, like, nothing like that. Right. Interesting memory, Mark. Uh, so you w- were out of the Navy in 1945? Oh, and, we got, and I got out in the middle of, just in time to go back to Caltech. Okay. So it turned out that I was in for a year and a half in the Navy. Oh, I also got a surgery done on a hernia I had that would have kept me out of the war, but nobody wanted to keep out of the war in World War II <laughs> because you felt like, like you were uh, a, uh, you know, unloyal right. to the country. And so, uh, so I went in anyway, and they, they never could detect it. I could hold it up so they couldn't, they couldn't note it. The doctors couldn't detect it. And anyway, I got it taken care of with surgery before I got out of the Navy, and that was the last thing. And then, oh, the other funny thing in the Navy was they assigned me after the school, I got through the school, even though the war was well over, the electronic school, then they assigned me to take, to repair movie cameras, the little, uh, uh, what is it, um, th- is it, uh, help me on this. The, uh, 16 millimeter. 16, 16 millimeter, millimeter with the wind up uh, yeah, clockwork. Yeah. 16 yeah. millimeter. Well, they were expensive ones for the Navy. Right. And uh, it turned out all we did was throw darts because nobody cared. And then the captain came in and caught us throwing darts. And, and we thought, oh, now we're going to be in trouble. And he said, hey, those dart, those feathers are a little ruffled. He said, 
I need to get you some new, <laughs> new, some new darts. <laughs> Interesting and thing and, and one of the happen. officers went off with one of the waves. That was the females' navy. The waves uh, ran off with one, and there was, you know, there was no discipline. You know, it was sort of like uh, like mash only in the real. <laughs> and so anyway, then like anyway, we, I got out and went back to Caltech, and okay. and uh, from from there, I did better than I did as a freshman for three years. I, my grades, and uh, I moved uh, closer to the school for a long time there. I actually uh, drove from my home to the school. And so you graduated from Caltech? Graduated in, in 40, 1949. Uh, couldn't get a job because I, I had a uh, and terrific... Sorry, what, what was the... So you graduated BS in... Oh, BSEE. BSEE, okay, electrical engineering. Okay. Right, and 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 I, and I had a, I had a professor in my, uh, high in the uh, senior, uh, uh, senior math, uh, mathematical physics, for seniors, and I scored a hundred percent on his final, and so he thought I was absolutely you know sensational, and and he wrote a letter for me, to Simon Ramo also a Caltech PhD, who ran engineering at Hughes mm -hmm. Aircraft. And they had this giant contract with the Air Force to make fire control radars, or fire control systems, excuse me. And, uh, and so that was a great place to get a job. And I thought, oh, surely they'll make me an offer with that the recommendation to Ramo. Instead, the uh, human services or human resources or personnel, as they were called then, lost it. <laughs> lost my letter. Oh, no. I couldn't even get it back from them. Didn't invite me in for an interview. And, and uh, uh, on top of that, I couldn't get in touch with, with uh, uh, Professor... Uh, uh, um, What's his name? Again. Um, we can plug the name in later when you do the transcript. Irving. I just said it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just said it before. Okay. He was the he was the cousin of. And Anderson, did you say it was? No. It? The cousin. No, it was, he was the cousin of uh, Irving, famous engineer for GE. Hmm. Robert Langmuir. Langmuir. Yeah. Robert Langmuir. Uh, I couldn't find him because he'd gone off on a sabbatical to Spain, <laughs> and so I couldn't get another letter. And so I ended up just, there were, there were no jobs then. It was, it was a, for whatever reason, all these guys came back from the war, I guess, and mm -hmm. they occupied the job. And uh, all of my classmates got on with Hughes Aircraft, so who knows? So I, I was driving along uh, in Burbank, and I saw a little little place that looked pretty run down, and it said Goslin Engineering. So I stopped to see what they did, and he hired me. But he hired me at a rate that was like 60% what I would have gotten at Hughes Aircraft. And I designed magnetic components for him for a year. Okay. And then I went back to Caltech get a master's degree because some of my other the other guys I knew did that and I thought well maybe I should do it too and so I did and I even tr tried to do something stupid and tr tried to still work for this guy who started paying me more after he saw I could do everything he needed <laughs> this Goslin and uh, and uh, I so I worked for him at nights and still tried to go to Caltech and in the daytime, but it didn't work out. After one semester, I had to drop that and just concentrate on Caltech. And, and I got a master's degree with a specialty in feed, feedback systems, feedback control systems. With, what year was that? Professor oh. Wiltz. That was in 1951. 51, okay. And, and I joined a company called Coleman Engineering 
that was uh, he was, Coleman was a graduate of Caltech, and the uh, Caltech had an employment department that um, led me to him. And uh, I worked for him for I worked for them for two years in all kinds of strange R and D projects. And then I thought I'd rather get into electronics. So, see, they think a Caltech graduate is like a physics graduate. He can do anything technical, <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway. They think. <laughs> so, yeah, so. And so you uh, went to work for Coleman and? Oh, so I went to RCA. Okay. And, and uh, I was with RCA five years. And after I was there about two years, they made me gave me my first supervision or management level as a group supervisor. And I was responsible for, they were working on a, a secret project for the Air Force, which I'm sure isn't secret anymore, so I can tell you. It was, uh, it, it was um, a, uh, a Doppler radar that hones in on the Doppler effect of targets that are moving, moving targets, and uh, they were they had the contract. I found out later in conjunction, conjunction with a, another company that had the same contract, Westinghouse. And uh, I came up with an I, I I was responsible for one part of it, the stabilized local oscillator, which was was not very big, <laughs> but. It was like the foundation of the Doppler radar because if, if this, if this, it was like the foundation frequency that you had to measure against with a frequency differentiator. So it had to be very stable, a pure sine wave practically, you know, at a at a at one frequency. And so I came up with an invention of using a, uh, and oh, and this was for a missile, so it was airborne. So I came up with an idea of, of using two cavities opposing with plates, two, two end plates in between with hydraulic fluid in them so they could flex either way, both ways. And, uh, and so you could make the, the, the center frequency of each going up and down in unison, but you could offset them with a screw at the end of one of the cavities to change its frequency a little bit from the other one. So you had you could then make a by subtracting the two signals that came out, uh, you had to first you know rectify and then mm. and then uh, subtract them. You got a, a curve like this versus frequency that 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 held a klystron in the center between the two frequencies okay. at z around zero in, in the um, differentiator form and uh, I got a patent on that and then it turned out we lost the contract after about four years maybe four and a half we lost it to Westinghouse the final contract so then they started put me on uh, things like uh, which I hated like countermeasures and you know where you have to imagine what somebody's going to do, <laughs> and then and then imagine what you can do about it. This is like playing chess with yourself. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I did it for a while, but then I decided to leave. And and where is RCA located? This was it, well, oh, it was RCA on the west coast. It was on, right. it was. It was on Olympic Boulevard on the west side of Los Angeles, not far from Santa Monica. Yeah, all right. Uh, and um, mouth gets dry when you. Sure. Take your time. Um, yeah. So it was a great location to have fun, though. And uh, and, and by the way, I I would never. I would never take overtime because money wasn't important to me. I knew that uh, 
there was a big bomb that Russia could throw at us, and <laughs> and uh, so I I said have fun while you can, <laughs> and that's what I did off hours. I was very serious on the job, and then off hours, I, w I didn't want to work overtime, so I wanted all the rest of the time to myself and Good. and uh, you know to fool around with ladies and play games and whatnot. On the beach at all? Yeah, oh yeah, I, I was a, got to be a pretty great uh, two-man volleyball player on the beach, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, and uh, oh yeah, Muscle Beach. Sure. Yeah, and I hung out at Muscle Beach and I knew the guy who ran it and he, he sometimes had an extra girl for me and <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like that. Sounds and like sometimes that. the girls didn't like the muscle man. <laughs> They're like a skinny guy, you know. <laughs> well, it, was, it was interesting. Um, and and I, well, when I met my wife, though, that all ended when I met my wife there. At, uh, she was the secretary to the, the personnel manager. At RCA. At RCA. Yeah. Russ Javens and... And... Uh, the name, what was his wife's name? His, her name's Jan. Jan, okay. His, his name was Russ Javens, but that doesn't matter right. you know, <laughs> in this story. Uh, so anyway, uh, we lived on the Sunset Strip for a while after we got married, and I even started, <laughs> I started a, uh, um, a, a TV repair store on the Sunset Strip next to Bublitsky's. And that was interesting, all the types of people, Hollywood actors and so on, <laughs> and, and there was a place next door called the Aware Inn where like Marlon Brando would have, would have hamburgers or whatever there, and yeah. We, we met all these kind of people. You said I had an interesting life, but you didn't, you didn't know the half. Didn't know the half of it. <laughs> and anyway, I, I got a job. The job I got was Aeroneutronic. Uh, uh, the Ford Motor Company got a bug in their, in their bonnet that they should go into, uh, into aerospace. So we're and, up to about 1958 now, I believe. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I went to uh, RCA in '53, and in '58 was five years later, and I left. Yep. And I and I was at went to Aeroneutronic, and there, the, almost every job I had didn't take advantage of what I knew before. <laughs> I had, of course, I'm a Caltech guy, like a physicist, so I can do, do anything, anything, you know. <laughs> so they, they brought me in, and they they wanted me to what was it analyze telemetry. And. And then it turned out that um, after I was there, maybe maybe like six months, the whole company, it was just, right, right at that point it was interesting, they had executives and they were using the old Grand Central Air Terminal in Burbank. And the, and, and the females there up on the upper lobby there were, were all working for these executives. And uh, then us, the peons who were high level engineers were downstairs working and and that went on long enough for them to get their big, wonderful, uh, uh, sensational uh, um, campus built down at Newport Beach. Mm. Uh, so so they got it built in about six months, and we all went down there, and we moved to Tustin in Orange County. And, and I did the telemetry study. They got a contract for a telemetry study that for, all the, for the joint services to analyze the different competing forms of modulation that were being used to send signals downstream, upstream from the, from the stations along the missile ranges. Uh, so, so it turned out, of course, that ultimately PCM turns out to be the best when you think of everything involved, even though PCM, um, once it drops out, it drops out completely, whereas FM or phase modulation or amplitude modulation, they don't die suddenly. At least you can go a little lower and gradually the noise comes in. But PC, once it, the noise drops it out, it's very rapid. A little more noise and it's gone. So that's what we discovered, you know. We got, we got, uh, ampli we got uh, data on it. 
and, and turned in a report and so on. And uh, at the end of that, there wasn't much to do there. Uh, uh, I had a buddy there who, was, who had the radar department and he asked me to come and join him, but we really didn't have any contract work to work on. And uh, so I started, I realized that isn't gonna last. So I, I started looking uh, partly to take advantage of my knowledge of the telemetry signals and anyway it turned out the company that hired me uh, was Radiation Incorporated and uh, they hired me I think it was like 1959 at the end of 59 or maybe the me. beginning of 60 right. uh, and uh, they didn't treat me too well, it turns out. Uh, Dick Holtberg hired me and I told him, I don't want to work on, on proposals at all because when I worked on proposals at my, la at my last two jobs, I didn't, I didn't run the proposal, somebody else did and they lost it. And I said, I hated that, working on something that long and thinking all about it and then you don't get a chance to actually prove you were right. <laughs> so. I didn't like that, you know. So, uh, so, so then, so then I, I, so I started doing studies, uh, and uh, and then I, I, I don't know why, but I, they, I hired, I don't know why they had me hire somebody because I was a senior, in, a, called a principal engineer, but. Uh, but I did hire a very, very bright guy from Italy, Fiorino Fiorini. And they also had me take over management or supervision of the, of the ACE uh, engineer for A to D and D to A converters. What a surprise. <laughs> Something I got into much later in, in spades. Okay, so, so, but after I was there about maybe uh, four or five months, <clears throat> I was pressed into service to work on a proposal. <clears throat> and I said, look, uh, you told me that you wouldn't give me any proposals. And he said, oh yeah, but their management, upper management is insisting on it. And so I said, well, okay. I'll work on this one uh, if you let me run it. At least I'll have myself to blame. <laughs> so he said, okay. And so it was, a, uh, it was something to do with, uh, oh yeah, it was like instrumenting monkeys in, in test sleds to see what happens when you shoot them at high speeds like what happened, you know, I guess in a space shot, I'm not sure what. but. Uh, don't remember now, but I remember going out to a company in Hollywood, California that was expert in, in uh, medical pickups and uh, got, the, got their input. I wrote the proposal and we lost it, not because we didn't have the best proposal, but because we did have the best proposal. But, but a, a college with, with practically no overhead won the, mm. won the contract. <laughs> One more way to lose yeah. in proposals. So, and so, but then the next three proposals I wrote, not only won, but they got the contract. So <laughs> I didn't have a loser you know, <laughs> on these proposals. And one of them was the one that where Fairchild was a subcontractor. And the reason I was able to line them up as subcontractor, because there were 90 bidders at, or 90 people at the bidders conference, engineers, probably more than one from one company, but I was the only one from radiation. And I said, oh my God, you know, there's all these, these people. And uh, I thought, how can I win this? But, but then I remembered that Bob Graham had come out and I had made, and he found out I was at radiation and I got a big 
got some of the key people from radiation in a room to hear his pitch on Fairchild chips. And I thought, oh, I'll contact him and see if he can line them up. After all, he's a, he's a to top marketing guy. And he did. He, he, uh, he lined up um, um, for me to visit um, Gordon Moore and Vic Greenwich. Gee, that's a name out of, I don't know where I got that. Yeah, Vic Greenwich, one of the founders of Fairchild, as right. you may know. And, uh, and I talked to them, and Fiorini went with me, and he was mainly enjoying the fact that he could get these wonderful California artichokes. <laughs> but, but anyway, he was a smart guy, and I relied on him too. And anything new or complex, he was terrific, even quantum mechanics. Uh, so, uh, uh, and we used to play chess together all the time. It was pretty good. Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, I won the contract. Oh, and one of the things I did that wouldn't have won it if I hadn't was we, we had an RF division at radiation and we had a data systems division. The data systems division was bidding it but the RF division, we couldn't, we didn't know how to get a, an integrated circuit. Um, oh, did I forget to say that, that that telemetry system had to be all integrated circuit, if at all possible. Wow, so and in 1961? And, and that so. was uh, 19, it was 19, six, toward the end of 61. Yeah. Yeah, because in 62 is when we won it. Early 62. So you didn't have a lot of choice of circuits. You had Fairchild Micrologic and some stuff from TI, I guess. It was Motorola. Motorola. Well, wait a minute. No, Motorola, Motorola wasn't there yet. No, right. I mean, didn't have Fairchild yet. Right. And, and, and TI didn't have a real planar <laughs> right. capability. Uh, so who was the other one you mentioned? Well, the only two that came to mind would be a Fairchild with Micrologic that came out in early 61. Micro who? Micrologic was the Fairchild Micro Micrologic. But was I don't know, they RT. couldn't build, nobody else could really build tra uh, planar train. But there was one other company, I think it might have been Motorola. Yeah, Motorola. Yeah, so they probably had something. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in any case, no, there, there had to be other companies. Oh, maybe, oh, I know what it was. The other companies that were bidding it were planning to bring in an IC company like Fairchild if yeah. they won it. I see, yeah. Whereas I had Fairchild from the beginning mm -hmm. to give me you know, any ideas on, on, the, on it. And so, so in any case, uh, what I did was they had, we had an RF division, I think, I think we bid, total bidding was, would have been like 500,000 or a little more. And, and, I, and so I thought that their bid is too high. So this was the last day of, of the, and I had to get it done. And it was not only the last day, but it was already like uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so I said, wait a minute. Uh, TRW has an RF capability, and I can still call them, <laughs> and I did. And they gave me a quote over the phone for what I needed for the, amp for the transmitter. And it was only like maybe $10,000. So I saved like over like $100,000, and, and that made the difference. I believe that made the difference in getting the price down to where we got the... Mm -hmm. We got the contract. And then the story changes that after that, I became a, oh, I remember now. They didn't, I, brought, I got the, those contracts, but they wouldn't let me manage them. They wanted me to get more contracts. If you're that good at it, <laughs> like a bird dog, go, go out and get us more, more birds. You can't eat the birds. So, <laughs> so I said, to hell with that. And within two weeks, I had a job at one of the companies I beat out for a, synchroni uh, a telemetry synchronizer uh, 
R&D project at Huntsville, Alabama with NASA. Uh, I didn't get the job with NASA. I got the job with the outfit that lost out when they thought they, had a, they were gonna win it. A guy named Parker Painter who ran a company called Dynatronics. So when he heard I won that contract, he, he hired me instantly. <laughs> He couldn't figure out how I beat him because he was always getting work from them. He knew them. <laughs> and and so, so I went to Dynatronics to run the data systems division there. And by that time, my wife said she didn't really like Florida. And so after I was there, maybe, I don't know, a couple of years, whatever it was. Oh, so the radiation job was in Florida. Yeah, I left radiation, I went to Dynatronics. But the, when you were working for radiation, that was in Florida? That's when I did what? When you were working for radiation, where were they located? Oh, they were in central Florida. Uh, in Melbourne yeah, see, area. See, yeah, Parker right. Painter had worked for radiation, Got and it. then he started a new company, Dynatronics, okay. to do some of the similar things. And he started it in middle Florida, which was about 60 miles away. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I had to move. To Central Florida, which I did, and I, I moved on to Lake Killarney, right on the lake surface where they had the water skiing championships that year. Uh, and uh, but my wife said, uh, you know, we should get back to the family and everything. So uh, so I said, okay, if I can find the right job. Well, I was hired by Hughes to run the advanced techniques department in the in their ground systems division. Uh, the computer part of their ground systems, and uh, it was the advantage in the computer de department, the advanced computer techniques. I think I need more water. <laughs> and so I did that. And they I even had the interesting experience of <clears throat> discovering I had an imposter working for me. <laughs> who had been some technician in another company nearby, and he was running back and forth, but he had this wonderful resume that he'd stolen. <clears throat> and I began to think, this, he can't be. <laughs> He's not the one he says he is. And, uh, but they went, and I went to somebody and they said, oh, we, you can't let him go, he's a PhD. And, he's, and I said, but maybe he is, but he lost his brain power or something. <laughs> and then sure enough, somebody discovered him. <laughs> And uh, that was a, another interesting experience. Now, was this at Hughes or at Dy uh, Dynatronics? That was at Hughes. That was at Hughes. Yeah, Dynatronics, I got a contract for them, but, but NASA wanted us to, to, f to take half the cost of it because we were gonna pioneer and make some miniature, um, miniature modules, like airborne modules. And Pete Petroff, who was an ace over at at uh, radiation had come to me and asked me if he could join our, our uh, uh, airborne section. And uh, he had this idea already, I think. And so he and I, I hired him and he and I went to, I think it was Washington DC and talked to NASA. And they said, we're ready to give you this contract, but you'll have to foot half the cost. Well, Parker Painter wouldn't hear of it, even though they were falling on hard times. Well, that was another thing. It didn't look like they were going to be able to hold up as they were because um, they were starting to run out of work. And I was getting blamed for laying people off <laughs> when I just got there. You know? In other words, I was almost like the, you know, like the, for that purpose. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so my wife said, well, let's go back to California. So we did. I got the job at Hughes, a nice job working for a Caltech uh, uh, PhD uh, running the uh, ground systems division. Oh, and, and on top of that, one of my te teachers at Caltech, my profs at Caltech, Norm Annenstein was there. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and, he, and he thought I was a you know, great guy. So I, Everything looked very great there, but then all of a sudden they cut off all the cost plus fixed fee contracts in, in the military. Was, so new times were <laughs> coming in, and uh, my 
my department uh, was was uh, was 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 eliminated, <laughs> and the people were just reassigned. And so, so I was reassigned to. Uh, I wasn't reassigned because somebody I worked for at RCA, uh, he found out. Well, his boss, I don't remember how he knew, but his boss told him about this, and he said, oh, he said, we can use you over at uh, Space Systems. And I barely got to Space Systems when I got a call that Gordon Moore wanted to see me <laughs> from Bob Graham. So that worked out. <laughs> Actually, I, I wrote a proposal for Space Systems before that happened, though. And guess what? <laughs> they won it. <laughs> and guess what? They didn't give it to me to run. <laughs> Again. And other, other engineers who didn't work on it, they were, work, they were on the contract. And then they kept coming to see me and asking, what did you mean by this? And how do we do that? <laughs> I'm supposed to explain. My, I wrote the proposal right. in 10 days. I'm supposed to explain to them over weeks on end what I figured out in 10 days. <laughs> <That's> the, <laughs> so anyway, I was glad to pull out of there and go to, and, and, and I thought the, next, the coming thing is semiconductors, right? right. Had I you was, been using semiconductors at all in any of these other designs, transistors? Not yet, but I was assigned, when I was running the advanced te techniques department at Hughes, I was just assigned to the semiconductor committee and I used to go down to Newport Beach, mm -hmm. where they had a uh, research lab, a research labs there, and uh, hear what the latest was that they were doing. They were actually developing ICs. Yeah. Uh, well, Hughes were a big factor in diodes in those days. I remember. Yeah, yeah probably. Diodes. It's hard to, to remember now, but yeah. I used to go down there once a month to uh, to see what's, what they were doing. So I was picked out. And I'm not sure, I can't remember why I was picked out for that, but um, I guess maybe the whoever was running, I forget his name temporarily, um, that was running the, uh, the division might have picked me out. And but so when I, got, when I got the Fairchild. So it's in 1966, you're yeah, hired. Yeah, the, so yeah, I was, I was hired. Uh, I was hired, you know, about uh, a, like a month early because I had things I needed to get done, uh, and then, and uh, then I came up. My wife stayed back until, well, she took a trip to uh, to Scotland, and it, with the kids because she had relatives there, and uh, and I went up and uh, stayed on Ar Rastadero Road Rastadero, at yep. the apartment there. I, I, I can remember some things, yeah. you know, Rastadero Road, and I found out that's, uh, and Rastadero is a stargazer, in other words, an astrologist. <laughs> Did you know that? Okay, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and, what I found out was really amazing. They'd had that contract for four years. I think the contract probably was already done, but they being Fitch, but the contract had been there four years ago. So they were they had been pushed to make linears. Sorry, what contract was it? At the Fitch? one that I won with Fairchild. Oh, I see. Remember way back? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I had I won a con that big contract at, right. with Fairchild uh, to make. An all IC Got it. telemetry system, mm -hmm. and the only exception was the RF, and uh, maybe the D to A converter, but that they certainly expected to have amplifiers, even though no amplifiers had existed until that at that time. Right. But after all, it's an R and D lab. <laughs> so how come Weidler was the first one <laughs> to come up with an amplifier, and not R and D when they had like a dozen people? Yep. Uh, and so I get there, and that's what I find. These are the people that are reporting to me. Oh, and I told Gordon Moore that I wouldn't come unless he 
got me a secretary like I was used to. <laughs> and, uh, and so he knocked out the walls and everything and re reshaped the office <laughs> so I could have an office like that. <laughs> got me a secretary. Uh, I'm way out of order. That, that's the trouble with, with, a, with a, uh, an oral. Uh, okay. That's okay. So you arrived at Fairchild in 1966. Yeah, I arrived there. I saw Gordon. that it was ridiculous. They hadn't accomplished anything. Uh -huh. Nothing they'd done had that I could find had transferred into production. Yeah, they did have some kind of a differential amplifier they were building up there, didn't they? No. That never went into production. No, the only thing that maybe they had that wasn't really used was I was told by Dave Pilling, who, who handled the processing, and I had no quarrel with the processing, and, and that was half the people. So the, it really left half the people, six, that were supposed to be doing the other part. But I think at the time, they didn't think of themselves as circuit designers. They thought, they thought of themselves as te te IC technology people, yeah. processing technology, like chemists and so on. One, yeah, one guy was definitely a chemist, I remember. And Dave, so Dave Pelling was the processing engineer who was, was assigned to me. And uh, a really nice guy and very good. And you may have noticed he sent me that in yes, those right. papers. And, uh, and I told him right away, I said, Dave, I know nothing about the processing. I said, actually, I've never really designed circuits. I said, and, oh, now Gordon Moore asked me that when he interviewed me. He said, can you, he said, uh, can you do, he said, uh, do, you, do you design circuits? I said, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe I've ever, maybe once I designed cir a circuit. I did help people to design circuits, but I didn't personally design the whole circuit. But I showed them how to mathematically analyze it. <laughs> and, and I said, he said, well, what do you, will you do? And I said, I can guarantee you that I can do the job I can do the job, and I'll hire circuit designers, and I definitely have experience at hiring people who are good, that know their stuff. I know how to do that. And he said, okay. <laughs> sent me, sent me a, an offer, and the offer was about like 10% more than I was making, and, and uh, my wife said, yeah, I think I like the San Francisco area, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, so yeah, so we, we took his offer. And uh, if he would give me a secretary, so that, so that, paid, me, that paid me more, but not to me. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that, so I noticed there was circuit design. I couldn't find anybody who knew what they were doing. And people started quitting. You know, like, like a phallus revolt. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because <laughs> uh, that gave me the chance to hire people. So I was told uh, when the middle of the year comes, you'll be able to hire, uh, you'll get two, there's two we're, we're only interviewing masters in double E. And you'll, you'll, get, you'll be able to hire two of them. Well, guess what? <laughs> We hired, they all wanted to come with our department because I, I, I'm like a young guy. Do you notice that? I mean, I'm not even old at all. I don't even think I'm old. I don't now and I didn't then for sure. And, maybe, and so I know that they like me, you know, they say I can interact with them and you know, and I, I'd, all, I'd ask them questions. This is my technique. You ask questions that are not easy to answer but they're, but they're not hard because of ignorance. They're only hard because they can't think well. <laughs> and, and you just see how they think. And the other one is you ask them to describe what they've done that they're proud of, that was really good, and see if they can describe it to you so you can understand it. And if they can do those two things, that shows they're smart, and, and they think rationally in terms of, of how to explain something. And they think about how it looks to the other guy. Because when you work at a company, if you can't work with other people, you can't, 
you're never going to get anywhere. <laughs> I mean, you have to interact with other people. It's not just enough to be smart. So that worked out for me. And besides, I can actually understand circuits. I mean, if they tell me something doesn't make sense, I'll know right away, and I'll say, that, you just said what? You know, <laughs> so. Who are some of the people you hired, Marv? Do you remember the? Oh, name? so I hired, I hired uh, Ken Stafford. Uh, I hired a guy, I'm gonna call him, I'm not sure if that was his name, but I think it was Morrison. He was from Ohio State. Ken Stafford was from MIT. Uh, um, um, Did you hire Garth? Was he there already? Garth Wilson? Oh, Garth yeah. is a special case. I actually found him, looked for him, and looked for somebody and found him. I wanted somebody to run circuits. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to run, the, I wanted two people who could run, who knew enough to run the, the engineering work in the both areas, circuits and process. So I, so I hired Garth. I, I found him in the IEEE proceedings, mm -hmm. the recent one, and uh, he'd written a paper. And I looked him up, and he was from Cal. And I found, I found him somehow, his phone number, called him and said, uh, and he was working at a microwave company in the East, the East Bay, Garth. And uh, I called him and said, uh, I'm interested in uh, talking to you about a job uh, supervising design engineers for in linear integrated circuits. And uh, if you're interested, I'd like you to come over and talk to me uh, a certain night when you're available at, at, at a bar in Palo Alto. And he came and I talked to him and then I made him an offer and he took it. Then the personnel guy at R&D said, boy, were you lucky to get Garth. <laughs> he didn't even ask me how I got him. He said, right. well, you were lucky to get him. And, uh, and by the way, his professor said that he was the best PhD that he'd had at Cal. So. That was a good hire. So I made sure he, no, that, before I hired him. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I don't, when hiring, I go for the absolute, I don't care if they're smarter than I am. I go for the best. I seldom meet anybody smarter than I am, frankly. I, I won the chess competition at Precision Monolithics against Erdy and the other engineers who played every day. I never played. And it was a double elimination. So, so, uh, um, so you know. Now, did uh, you hire George Erdy into Fairchild? Uh, yeah, George Erdy I hired from University of California. Mm -hmm. He was a friend of Andy Grove, by the way. Uh, and they're Hungarians. And uh, so was Leslie Vadas down for me, right. who helped me design a, a uh, multiplexer with MOS, MOS multiplexer. Uh, and uh, when did, there was more. How about Full Dave Fulliger? The, Dave Fulliger, yeah, I interviewed and hired. Yeah, he looked good, very good, because he was very personable and, and uh, he could definitely explain what he'd done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and smart at answering a, you know, a puzzle now, or a question. What kind of circuits did you have these people working on? Or? Oh, that's where, that's where I came in. Mm -hmm. I was a system engineer and I knew the kinds of things that were needed to replace these, these bulky modules. Right. It was amazing the difference in size <laughs> that you could do with a, in a dual inline package. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure you agree with that. <laughs> and, and so I had them working on um, a comparator amplifier, which you need for A to D conversion to compare, uh, a, uh, an instrumentation op amp you need for very low level signals, like microvolt signals, without a chopper, by the way. Was that the 725? 
725. Yep. And that's what Dave Fulligar was on until he was reassigned when he cleverly found out that he could take the 741, redesign it better, and, and, and he knew that we had a, he was enterprising, he knew that we had a process in production for a capacitor, a mm -hmm. capacitor on, on board. On yeah. board. Yeah. And so one day I'm down in the, I'm down in the lab, which was in the, in the basement of R&D, the electronic lab. Of course, being Gordon Moore, a, a, a chemical engineer running it, <laughs> the electronics went down in the basement <laughs> and the processing went up on the main floor. <laughs> uh, just not really, but anyway, uh, 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 the, uh, I was down in the basement like I tended to do, walk around and you know see how people were doing. And there's Dave Fulligar and he says, Marv, I said, you know, what are you up to? And so he says, he says, I got something to show you. He says, look, he says, I've just put together a, 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 a breadboard, a breadboard of, uh, of an amplifier that, that could replace the 741 because it has a capacitor built in. 709. Replaced. I mean the 709, so right. excuse yeah. me. Yeah, the 709, the 741 is what, what he came up with, yeah. Right. And so there's a story I'm gonna tell that he never told, it was kind of annoyed me. He told the story that he said, he said that he, said that, uh, he had a design that could replace the 709 and Overnight, I mean, immediately, there he was, suddenly finds himself in Gordon Moore's office. And, uh, and the next thing you know, he, he sent to production. It wasn't that way at all. It was like this. He told Marv Rudin that he could, he could uh, overcome what, what Weidler had done at, at Fairchild and then, and then also when he went to National. Right. And I said, gee, that's... That's terrific. I said, uh, he said, but I don't want to, he said, but they want me to go to Mountain View to work in production. He said, I want to stay in R&D. And I said, well, if you do that, you'll be famous. If you do it and you're successful, you'll be famous. You can name your ticket. He said, you'll be able to, to come to R&D if you want stay there or you know whatever you even go outside the company and name your price it'll be that important and you see i wanted to do it because i hated Le weidler because of the way he acted toward me when i asked him what did he need and he just laughed at me because he was getting ready to leave right but the point is you know he wasn't civil weidler and I'm always civil. I mean, who would, who would be otherwise? You know, only a nut. And I, I'm coming to him and say, what, do you, what could we do to help you make better circuits? And he wouldn't tell me anything. And, yeah. you know, and he just, and I said, well, let me, let me tell you this. I'll be successful with you or without you. And I, I was. That's what PMI was. He couldn't come close to what we did because he, he, his processing guy, Talbert, would never think of laying down the wafers. <laughs> so let, let's finish off at, at huh? R, uh, let's finish off the work that you did at R and D. So there was a, a comparator precision op amp. Okay. So uh, then, all right. So that was that was uh, how the 740. Oh, but I didn't tell you what happened. Right. So what happened was, in order to get him to go, I said to. Gordon Moore, I think you should give him a raise <laughs> if, as an incentive to go. Right. And, and, then I, and then he said he would. And I said, then I brought him into his office. It was all staged. Okay. He, he, he wasn't forced to go, but he was offered a raise by Gordon Moore if he, if he would go. Okay, so that's a story worth telling yeah. because he never told it. And that annoyed me. I did so. I did him a good, th good purpose. So gave good. him good advice, and got him a, 
and got him a raise and got, oh, and got him a promise from Gordon to take him back to R&D after he finished that job, that project. Good. Now, I never told him that, but he knew part of it. He, he knew he wouldn't have gotten that raise. I mean, unless he thought Gordon thought of it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. All right, to go on, the other circuits uh, were, uh, were of course a D to A converter, and uh, and it was to be it was to be done with film resistors, because we didn't even know that we could possibly do it with diffused re resistors, without trimming them, and, and it's not known how to trim fused resistors, because heat causes them to flow and right. in in un unfor unforeseen ways. Understand the, the the impurities will move sure. in unforeseen ways, so you can't do that. You can do it with with film film by just taking away film. You know, you can't do it by adding film. Okay, so then what were the other functions? Uh, uh, there were there were different. Oh, well, there was just a plain like an audio. I don't think we went for an audio amplifier because they already had one and. And they don't, ha they don't have to have great DC performance at all. There's no DC in audio. So, so what else? Let's see. There were... Yeah, I don't recall what the other ones... What were they? That's okay. So let's... Oh, uh, there was a high impedance input as well. Yes. There's a low impedance input. There, there were some with variations. Oh, and another thing I did, even though I didn't design circuits, I, what I did do is when Erity said, I can't get the 725 to get, a low, to, to, to get a low offset voltage at the input, and I said, why not? He said, the heat from the output somehow flows unevenly back to the input. I said, well, why don't you put the output further away by making the chip rectangular? He said, they don't do that. So why not? He didn't know. I said, look, why don't we ask them? <laughs> Since then, it's a rectangular chip. Right. <laughs> that came from me. Good. Nothing big, just, just like uh, laying down the wafer to get laminar flow is <laughs> nothing big, but it had all the... <laughs> All the effect in the world. Sure. All right. Okay. So, so I don't remember all the other ones. That's so. okay. We've we've got a a, a sense yeah. of the kind of products that were coming out there. Yeah. And so you did this for three years. I yeah. Think. But what we found out was, well, we d I did it for two years. Yeah, almost three years. Mm -hmm. I left in uh, like so. October, November, but that was after the Motorola people came in. I see. And that was a good reason to they leave with, with Les Hogan, you know, right. acting gruff and comes down into the lab. That was about September like, of Who 68. are you peons, you know? Right. Oh, and on Jerry, Brice oh, not Jerry, uh, Jerry Sanders with him. <laughs> uh, so, and Jerry Sanders is saying, how come you haven't got more out? You know, uh, well, I got the 741. <laughs> that was plenty. Uh, uh, let's see. So you say, is that all you did in three years? <laughs> Something like that. No, no. Uh, no, actually, uh, they kept trying and trying. It was hard to do linear things in R&D because their process wasn't any good, right. and they didn't know it, and we couldn't get at the we could, uh Oh, by the way, another one I hired was from Caltech, was, uh, as you may know, was um, uh, uh, um, you know, your friend, uh, our Ted, friend. Uh, Ted? Oh, Ted, Ted, uh, uh, Ted Jenkins. Jenkins. Ted yes. Jenkins. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was hired from Caltech. So almost from, and from Stanford was the one I can't, whose name I can't remember. And one of the reasons is that he, he couldn't design. <laughs> he, 
He certainly couldn't do processing. He wasn't a chemical engineer, and he couldn't design. And the thing I liked about him was that he, that he told me stories about his father had told him this and that. But later I realized that he needed a father to tell him what to do. <laughs> and so I got him a job down in, I can't remember his name. It might have been maybe Edwards. Or, anyway, I got him a job down testing in, in Mountain View rather than okay. letting him go. Uh, don't you think a guy with an MS from Stanford ought to be a, a good tester in Mountain View? <laughs> so, uh, of course, you got to give me a break here. Let's see, it's now, it's now, uh, it's now 70, no, uh, uh, 17, and this was in 66, so that's 50 years. Yep. <laughs> You're doing fine, Marv. You're doing fine. I wish I could remember half of what I did back in those days. It's gone. So come, the, the Hogan crew came in. Um, I guess Leo Dwork moved Well, we in. were kind of plotting to leave, I see. and they came in, and that, that put the capitals on it. Okay, okay. <laughs> and like, like um, um, first it was a, a process engineer, uh, um, Dave Pilling, who reported to me for processing, and he said he wanted to go with me and Garth and start a new company, and he even invited me up to, to the mountains to his father's cabin, or, or uh, cabin or house, and, uh, and, and it looked like sure he was gonna go, and then he, he got cold feet. Mm. Then there was another guy whose name I can't remember who was at Fairchild, and, and he said he, he wanted to go, and then he got cold feet. <laughs> Uh, and so, so we just went anyway. <laughs> so and we being you we, and yeah, I and, I and, uh, and, and, and uh, Garth and Garth went anyway, okay. without anybody surely to come for the processing. Right. And what what good luck that Jerry Brissie calls. <laughs> right. So let's back up a minute. Did did you have a, a very well developed idea of the products you wanted to make? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so, yeah, okay, so. D to A converter obviously was needed okay. because we couldn't, we, we, our process wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Even though we had a 10-bit chip, it was sort of like, uh, <laughs> it was like some midget think he's gonna, he's gonna win the high jump contest. I mean, I mean, a 10-bit chip, and it was only accurate to seven bits from zero to 80. And the big market right then was for military right. that needed to be at, at least zero to 85. And, and usually, if you wanted to get everything, minus 55 to 125. Sure, and the products and, you were competing against were discrete were modules. Were modules and, 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 and oh, 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 not, not only modules, but many were built by engineers on circuit boards with other things. Got it. They were hidden. Yes. We, when, we, when we went to form Precision Monolithics and get the financing, uh, a, uh, a, a, a management consultant was assigned named Jerry Frank from, uh, from uh, the Valley, LA, uh, San Fernando Valley. Uh, and, um, and he admitted to me, you know, he said, well, what's the market? And I said, I don't know what it is because it's a hidden market. It's being designed by des circuit engineers with other circuits all on the same board. Mm -hmm. And they said, so you don't know either. So Told him point blank, you don't know either, and, and he had to admit it. He said, no, we, don't, we can't find any way to find out how many are used. Now this management consultant, you hired him or it was hired by? No, the no, the, the people, Borns, that was considering Okay, so you approached Borns and said, you wanted them to fund this company and they hired a management consultant. Yeah, I had a cousin make a call to them uh, uh, named Martin and I asked him if he would you know, help me out and make a call so they won't know, so nobody will know, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, he said, you know, I have some people and he, he told them what kind of people. Right. And they said, yeah, they were interested and then I said, okay, and uh, well, I also got Beckman, the ones who, the ones who backed. Uh, Shockley. 
shot you. Right. Uh, Dr. Ballhouse, the president of Beckman, met me at the airport, clandestine, to see if that they would, would back me, and he was gung-ho about it. He realized this was different right. than what happened with Shockley. But Beckman, Arnold Beckman didn't, and I never met Arnold Beckman. Yeah, I think I could have persuaded him that he was making a mistake. But uh, so, uh, uh, so I had to drop that one. But Borns came through, and I also had people in San Francisco, Hambrick and Quist, but, but they, they uh, didn't treat me very well when I went up to see them and made me sit around and I didn't like that. And, and then there was another guy who really was nice and he wanted to back me, but he said he had, didn't have the money yet that, that Sears Roebuck was gonna put up money to put into high tech. And uh, I, I wish now I'd waited <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't like the backers, as you well know by now. Uh, we could have really done fantastically <laughs> Sure. I mean, two, we could be doing the two billion a year that analog devices doing that. How much money did Bourne's put up for the company? They only put up three hundred million, and they were so stingy that three hundred thousand, maybe. I mean, three million. Three million. And, and they were so stingy. You know, equipment costs a lot in semiconductors. Yep. Semiconductors uh, cost because of the equipment cost, we couldn't do it on our own. Right. On our own funding, but. Uh, because of, uh, anyway, they put up three, three million, but it was, it was credit. It wasn't even money. <laughs> they signed up for the credit on it. Right. <laughs> that was, that, but, but still, Garth was antsy. He was antsy. Oh, I didn't say I got a contract in between when we first took off. I got a contract with Pete Petroff, the one that went off with me to get that contract from NASA. Right. He, he ended up working for NASA in Huntsville. And he, he got me a contract to design a micropower amplifier for space use. And Garth and I worked on that. And that was helping to, I think it paid our expenses for a while, but Garth was getting antsy about how long that was gonna last. <laughs> and I, so I loaned him some money, and I didn't have a lot at the time, but I loaned him some money, and uh, he paid me back later after he started the company, but uh, all of that in order to keep him from bolting, because right. I thought he, he, he'd get nervous and wouldn't hang on in there, because I wanted to wait for the guy from Allstate, who, you know, he was gonna have a lot of money, and so unfortunately, that was an, a decisive point in my life, so to speak, because Bourne's even bought everybody else out, which was foolish. It was stupid. You don't buy people out. <laughs> I mean, when they're ace contributors to the company. So anyhow, uh, let's see, so where I was. So you formed Precision Monolithic in about So we left on our own. We, we took that contract. Then ultimately, we got the funding. Right. Uh, and this and, was 1967 uh, or so, right? And we got the funding. We made offers to uh, Waddy Cotter as a stop back. Uh, he knew thin films well, and he was a stop cap in case this new guy didn't work out for the, uh, the processing. So uh, he, was a, he was good. He was from a top school in England, Waddy Cotter of mm -hmm. Cambridge or one one of the two top was Oxford or Cambridge. Sure. Uh, and and so we and so he hired in. Uh, with, they they all got uh, beginner stock. Uh, Garth and I got half the stock. Garth got half what I got, and we got thirty percent all together. Uh, um, so. Now you said you hired a process guy. Tell me the story behind that. Okay, Jerry Brissy was a, a really a, a serendipitous case. <laughs> he, 
he called he called me when once an or, uh, an article came out from uh, um, electronic news that said a company named Precision Monolithics was starting up in in uh, Santa Clara County. They actually said uh, in Palo Alto because originally we were going to start in the hills in Palo Alto in the in the uh, uh, high tech. Uh, uh, company district there behind Stanford. On, on the Stanford Research Park or in the, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Stanford Research Territory, only up in the hills there. We were going to be on a hill mm -hmm. overlooking. That's <laughs> where Xerox ended up. Yeah, overlooking, uh, yeah, right. Over, Xerox ended up there. Overlooking uh, Fairchild R&D. And, <laughs> kind of funny. And uh, then later they changed their mind and decided that the restriction, he didn't like the restriction that you can only get a lease there. You can't get an ownership. So we ended up in on Space Park Boulevard in Santa Clara. Okay. And we were putting up a building and we moved into a real estate office on Scott Boulevard that was just big enough to take the people we hired um, which were about maybe half a dozen. It was Garth, Brissy, um, Cotter, um, um, and uh, I, I, I found uh, 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 Dooley through, uh, through Garth. Garth didn't know Dooley, but he knew somebody who did and somebody he went to school with. And uh, I called that guy and he didn't want to come with us, but he told me about Dooley. That's Dan Dooley. Dan Dooley. Yeah. So, I hired, so I called Dan Dooley and asked him to come up. And when he interviewed, he said he had a, an ace technician who knew thin film really well. And that was the same outfit that could do the, the RF for that contract I got at radiation, TRW, microcircuits. I think it was. I think the power was probably all, all one, but maybe not. It might have been separate. But so anyway, they both hired in, um, and um, so we had them, and then we had uh, Erty. Yeah, who else would there be? Hmm. Anybody I have a name? Let's see. Yeah, Erdy didn't have his own technician. And Cotter did come, so I think that's it. Okay. So what uh, was the first product that you brought out? Yeah, and the first product was one that was relatively easy using... I found out what... Oh, and I talked to Brissy a lot when I interviewed him, and, and also to find out why his process might be so good. I where, felt we weren't sure yet. Where did he come from, Proceed? He came from Tektronix. Tektronix. Okay. And, and when we interviewed him, I asked him a lot of questions, and I, and I found out when he told me that he lays the chip wafers down, I said, oh, that might give, like, laminar flow, and that might give more uniform than we could get it, uh, uh, impurities to go in that, then we were able to do it Mm -hmm. Fairchild R and D, so I, so I thought I had a reason then to hire him, and he said he had six more processes that were good that he'd played with, so I thought, gee, he's like a walking process machine if we need it, so we've got to hire him, <laughs> and we did, and but I talked to him a lot, like he talked me into putting as uh, liquid asphalt, what do you, floors on. Oh, it was liquid, uh, maybe you know, liquid, uh, it's, it's where there's no tiles, it's all mm. a, a liquid coating on the floor, so there's no cracks to hold dust. Got it. He wanted me to do that, to make, sh make sure we'd done everything we can mm -hmm. to minimize the dust. Well, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's the same stuff that you, epoxy. 
Okay. Yeah, it's epoxy floor, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah, that was another secret, trade secret, <laughs> epoxy floor. Um, and you could get me drunk if you wanted, but you'd never get it out of me. <laughs> I, I knew what was important, you know. So, so anyway, we were at that real estate office, and and then you guess who comes to see me? But Ray Stata and Emil Emil Rexsteiner. Rexsteiner. Why I remember Rexsteiner, I don't know, because I was told later that he'd been a fry cook in New York City, and somehow he became president of Analog Devices at that time because of financial reasons. Okay. He was trusted by, you know, I guess the backers for the money, to see that the money was properly handled, and uh, I guess. And Ray Stata, so why did they come to see me? Ray Stata was nosing around to see what we were up to because he, they had just bought a company called Pastoriza that was in A to D and D to A converters. And Pastoriza was a key guy at, at, from then on at uh, at analog devices, ADI, and and he he only joined them the same year that we started Precision Monolithics in '69, when we were sitting in the real estate office. <laughs> so, so uh, so naturally, it was very important to see what's the state of the art. He he had the hood spot to come out and and visit us at the real estate office. And, and what were they, they were building modules at that time? Right? Only modules. modules. right. They couldn't, oh, they might have been using some of Fairchild's linears, uh, although they weren't very good, but it might, maybe the 725 mm -hmm. they might have used. Mm -hmm. And so, but they were out there nosing around about the DDoA converter, and he told me, he said, well, the way we build them, he said, what we do is we build four bits at a time, and then we hook them together. Mm. Well, I knew if you do that, you've got a, you've got a nightmare of a problem trying to align sure. each group of three so that, they're, so that they're, they don't occupy more than a, a, a minimum bit of, of, of the full scale. And they'd have to do some trimming and things like that, you know. So it'd be a lot of trouble compared with just, we're, we're gonna build it cavalierly. We're gonna build it all at once with no trimming, just the whole circuit, the amplifier, mm -hmm. even if we can, the comparator amplifier, all on the chip. Oh, for, that's for an A to D, excuse me. And for a, D, for a D to A, we'll have the output amplifier all on the chip and the resistors. And we might have to use thin film resistors, we're not sure yet. That was my message. So he came to see you before you had introduced or built a product. We, we didn't even have our building up. I see. We got a new he building on Space Park. We were this. building the building. Yes. Okay. And 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 our and our process guy, he was super. He was buying the equipment and having it installed. Mm -hmm. Everything was new. And it had to be new. It had to be to his order, because he's the guy who had the knowledge of how to right. do the process. Right. So, so there we were, um, and uh, when, when we finally got the building built and we started to run things, the guys from Fairchild were wowed by what they saw, you know, by the tests and so on, the uniformity and, you know, mm -hmm. they had some test patterns. And so they knew they could build a 10-bit, right. uh, pardon me, a 6-bit. D to A converter, like rolling off a log. So the, the first product you brought out then was an op amp, and Dan Dooley designed this? No, George Rudy designed George all the op amps, and Dooley op designed all the D to A's. I see, and... And, and later he designed the, the... Oh, and then when the A to D's were built, that was a bit later, I managed to hire the absolute best person in the country on, who knew linears. The guy who had worked in telemetry and systems, uh -huh. and, uh -huh. named John Bowers. John Bowers, okay. And and all those you may have seen in our I our nineteen seventy two catalog. Yeah, he wrote some. He, he did the modules, and he uh -huh. and he wrote the application material. And he really knew his. He, 
and he was he was he was nitpicking to the finest degree good which you want in an engineer <laughs> absolutely yeah and he worked for me at Dynatronics I see. In, the, in the airborne division Got it. That's the same one that I hired Pete Petroff into yeah so so uh, he didn't find me to be a bad manager he came out he took the offer and everything everything went great and he and he's the one who went with me and the sales manager to to uh, New York to demonstrate the first uh, full DDO, full first DDoA converter two chip in a dual inline package that would run 10 bit accuracy to a half bit over the full military temperature range from minus 55 to 155. Analog devices wouldn't have a chance to do that. Sure. And this was about 1970. The same company that's right. bragging that during those years we were right in the running. You know, mm -hmm. you don't realize it's phony. So this is 1970. You brought out this two-chip, 10-bit. In in, in in at the end of by the end of 1969, we had our building, and very quickly, they I don't recall whether it was right at the end or right at the beginning of 70, but it was it was right in that time that the six, and they and they only built the six-bit one because because they heard sales heard that, or or that uh, JPL wanted a, they wanted an IC D to A converter if they could get one uh, to put on their space shot to the moon. They hadn't, they still hadn't got to the moon with a man, but they were shooting things to see what it's like there. And of course they found out it's, it's moon dust. <laughs> Anyhow, to go on. And so you built uh, the six bit for Yeah, DPL. and we didn't sell. The, the six bit wasn't a big seller, but I'll tell you what was, were the amplifiers that you questioned about whether being they were superior. <laughs> they were so superior that we- And w what were the numbers of those, amplifi those amplifiers? That was- well, well, some of the main amplifiers they wanted to get into sockets with, say, we've got a better one. Okay. And you can put them right in the same socket. Got it. Because so, those are in production. Right. That's why it was important. So they, all those, the SSS, SSS for, for superior second, second source mm -hmm. amplifiers were built so they get into sockets that are already right. in sockets. And you can generate revenue more quickly that Yeah, way. quickly yep. because yep. they're in production. Yep. It takes time in that market, unfortunately. Sure. So that so, was the OP1. So and then, then we had other ones like OP1 right. for the future that would get designed in, but we'd have to wait for production on those. Yes. Right. And, and I would swear that we had an 8-bit converter that we'd done, but we didn't, and I think we brought it out. And I can only, I can only say that I, maybe we knew at the end of, of 01 that we were gonna bring out uh, a 10-bit in 02, and so, so we stopped doing the 8-bit. It's the only thing I can think of, because I remember that Dooley told me, hey, I can easily do 8-bits. Mm -hmm. So you did a 6-bit that was And the by the way, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they, they were untrimmed and the 8-bit was diffused resistors. So we had a 6-bit, and I believe he had an 8-bit, and, and I think I'm puzzling about is why wasn't it in, in the 2000, the uh, 72 uh, uh, buyer's guide. Mm. And I believe, by the way, those came out at the end of the previous year, just like cars do. Yeah. You know, what, what are we gonna have next year? So some of the things they said, we're gonna release them in this year, but they weren't out yet at the beginning of the year. And they had the AIMDAC 100, which we had, I remember being at New York City and demonstrating it, but we still, it wasn't a product yet that was released, so. You said that AIM, A-I-M? A-I-M, and the A-I-M, by the way, stood for, I coined all those names, like the, like how to name the products. Keep it simple, because it will stick in people's memory. Op one, op two, mm -hmm. DAC one, DAC two. I get complicated. Right. These aren't just another product. Sure. These are gonna last a long time. 
And uh, AIM stood for Analog Integrated Microsystems, which yeah. meant not IC, not totally IC, but rather an assembly of ICs and maybe even some discrete components mm. if needed. Turned out none of those needed any. Those were all, <laughs> well, maybe they did have a few discrete, but they couldn't be very big because they fit inside a dual inline package. Right. So, so, and I didn't scrutinize what they put in there, I have to admit. <laughs> but I, I was just proud of them and knew that they could do it. Oh, and by the way, here's a, here's a human interest part. There was a guy named John Webster who worked at, at Fairchild with us in our, in our department, but he was like a do-it-all a do kind of technician without any formal training. Uh, he could have just as easily been an insurance man. <laughs> he, he was a very nice guy, strong guy, built well built, and uh, everybody liked him. And, and he was hired in to work as a technician, and and he came to me and and I said, I and I said, well, I'm gonna, I have to be in New York City the next day, and you st and the and he said and the people don't have it done yet. They don't have that AIMDAC, AIMDAC ready yet. And so, I said, well, okay, and I guess that's the way it goes. And he said, no, Marv. He said we're gonna work round the clock. The guys have, have promised, we'll work round the clock and we'll have it. <laughs> and they did. So you were able to go back to New York and demonstrate. And it's this. funny because I, I felt strange because I didn't feel like I had in any way, you know, stimulate, you know, in any way tried to make them work all night. But they did. It was amazing. And, uh, and, and I went back there, and Wayne Peacock was the sales manager, and I, I had the marketing part, which is create ads and, and, and give talks out in the boondock, wherever. And so I went to New York to give the talk, or to, to, to be on a panel with Ray Stata and Bernie Gordon, and there might have been somebody else, but it was us three as far as all I remember. And uh, Bernie Gordon, he designed the he had his company and he did very high accuracy D to A and A to D converters up to like 14, 15 bits, maybe even 16, I don't know. You know, he'd trim resistors, whatever it took. Then there was Ray Stata sitting next to me and, and he said, uh, he said that, you know, we're doing it with, uh, like I told you earlier, two, two uh, four uh, bits at a time and we're putting them together and and we're putting them in a module. <laughs> and I said, well, you've heard how it used to be in the olden days. <laughs> I was nervy. And I said, and, now, and then you heard what it's been till recently, and now you're gonna hear how it is now and into the future. <laughs> and, and somebody told me they've met more than one person who was there, and they still remember it 20 years later because, because it's like saying to you, this is a new roadmap, you know, it's like, <laughs> It was like I wanted to be the, the uh, usurper of the market because I needed, we needed to be. And even if they didn't like it, they weren't our, Ray Stato might be a customer and so might Gordon, but the volume of a guy building super high accuracy A to Ds and D to As is not gonna be very large and his price per is gonna be way up. And Ray Stato, the modules, they can't make them as cheap as you can make chips and put them into a IC package. And so, uh, and so, yeah, I could sell them to him, but I, my idea was to take over his market. We should be able to do that. It should take us a couple of years to get the best ICs. And during that time, we can start putting out modules that, that'll fit into his sockets and maybe even smaller ones that don't have to fit in his sockets, that people would prefer if they're starting from scratch. And that's, that was my thinking, and that's what I, so later on when he wanted to buy from us, I wouldn't sell to him. And so that's why you'll see that he's gone out of his way to, to belittle my company by saying uh, they did six bits, 
and they did a and they did a, did a two chip converter but he never said we did a 10 bit in two, in in uh, seven in uh, 72 and we did you saw the proof even even though it was still to come out it was coming out in 02, in 72 mm -hmm. among other things even a even a little a to D converter in a dual inline package. Sure. So let's, let's get this then. So you did a, a six bit with diffused resistors. Six with bit with diffused, diffused, an eight bit with diffused. Eight. But the big thing was the ten bit the ten that bit. even got eleven bit accuracy on some yield. And that was a first a two chip. You know what yield is. You did a two chip solution first, and then you did a monolithic. Yeah. Right? When we found out we could do it. With monolithic, right. we stopped. We we stopped offering the 10 bit, I mean the, the uh, AIM DAC, right? Because nobody nobody would prefer the AIM DAC, right. If you could get the and that was 72, and that was in 72. Well, it's it, it's in the it, it's pr there's proof in the 72 buyer's guide, right? At the beginning of the year, when it said we will release this year a 10 bit. And I remember that they was, he was getting 10 bit yields at the end of 71. Mm -hmm. And uh, how well was this received by the market? It, it was a sensation. Okay. Yeah. It, but but the, so were the amplifiers mm -hmm. for, you know, it's just that the amplifiers for, for the history, the history museum, just don't seem as unique. They're better. Parameters are better, and, sure, sure. and others couldn't build them right. at the time. And I wouldn't be surprised if others found out how we were doing it, because even it was a trade secret. It wasn't patented. Right. Why would you patent a trade secret when you can't look at the product and see how it was done? Yeah, sure. There's no way you can tell. Yeah. Somebody from National came over, an engineer, and he wanted to buy our chips. And uh, the, the, the lady out in the lobby went in, got him a chip, and sold it to him. And she shouldn't have, but two years later they hadn't brought out any A to D at National. So, so roughly, what was the revenue of the company by '72? Do you remember? No, I don't remember. No. Okay. Um, okay. It, was, it wasn't enough to break even yet. Okay. Um, so how are you financing it? Uh, that that was using Borns's three million. Okay. They still hadn't used it up. So, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, how were we fine? No, they, we hadn't used it up. They might have been loaning more money in. Mm -hmm. I think that might have been it. Um, now, by 74, I would say we, were, we should have been at break even. Mm -hmm. Gee, I should have known that. Huh. That's okay. Just trying to get a sense of. Uh, and uh, do you remember it's how interesting. Many... And, and and Jim Grugan, who had the financial, was was my friend. But he didn't have to worry about money if we were short of it. Okay, so it, hmm. was, it was the Bourne's line of credit then that was basically. Uh, yeah. Supporting. Right. It was. Okay. And what other products came out after the ten bit? Monolithic. Were there any other? Uh, oh, there were. Really there there were absolutely loads of amplifiers. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many George Ury got out, right. and he had a patent on, and he was terrific. And he he knew amplifiers by then. He started knowing very little at Fairchild, but by this time it was three years at Fairchild, right. and now about a, nearly a year just to plant his products, or right. half a year anyway. And, and then he could actually work with the processing engineer to manipulate the process to optimize it. Right. And so, and so he just did wonders. I mean, those, those amplifiers, uh, you wouldn't put, you wouldn't say superior second source if they weren't superior or the or the people would laugh at you. The the designers who were buying would sure. they'd laugh at you. Uh, so, and then on top of that, we wouldn't 
we even had better ones that had their own name, like Op 1 and Op 5. Uh, so, and so you really had two star designers? Two Do stars. Dewey and Erdy. Right. Uh -huh. That's all we had, the, <laughs> nobody else. And right? then, uh, and then we, uh, uh, Garth brought in somebody. I don't know, know, his, know his name, partly because I don't remember his name because, part, oh, Campbell, his name was. And I told Garth he shouldn't hire him because he didn't score well on our, on our intelligence test. We, we had one of these, in, uh, what's it called? Uh, super, no, it's a German name uh -huh. for intelligence test. And he didn't score well on it. And I said, I said if, you, if you hire him, he said, but he's experienced. And I said- Was this Dave Campbell, big tall Dave guy? Dave Campbell, right. Yeah, I know Dave, yeah. Oh, you know him? Sure. Well, I said, you shouldn't hire him because he didn't score well on the intelligence test. He, you can tell him this now. <laughs> and I said, but he said, no, but he said, he's got a lot of good experience. Uh -huh. And I said, well, experience alone may not do it. And then I noticed after he hired him, Dave Campbell was always together with Garth. Okay. They were together inseparable. So he's like helping him and helping him. And, I, and finally he said to me, gee, I'm, he's wearing me out. I'm helping him so much. And, he's, and he, admit, he said, I probably should let him go and finish his amplifier myself or Erdy. And that's what he did. Okay. Yeah. I shouldn't be telling this, but. That's okay. No. Uh, it was much later I knew Dave, and I haven't seen him for 20 years, so. Oh, okay. He was at AMD designing interface circuits, I remember. Oh. Okay, so now we get See, we were looking for knee plus ultra people. Right. I, uh, obviously, a lot of people are quite good and can hold a lot of positions, mm -hmm. but I, we, we, need, we needed to make all our money count <laughs> right. and get as much as could be done, you know, sure. all of that. It, 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 I was like, uh, like Trump, sort of Trumpian in a way, but, but uh, I'm not happy with Trump anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so by 74, um, the company is probably breaking even now. Um, and did, did Bournes buy out the whole company? What, what happened? No. What, what happened, happened was... Uh, I, I had a five-year contract to see that I wouldn't leave in the middle before, they, before we made, were worth the, the investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so did Garth. And so, uh, and so I, uh, I left and, and I thought, and they didn't offer me anything. But, but like I've told you, I, I didn't want to work for them anymore, and I left anyway. I figured if, if, if it has to be, I know how to build another company that'll wipe out precision monolithics, <laughs> uh, I felt. Although that wouldn't be so easy. <laughs> but anyway, that was, I, was, I was feeling brave. And so, so, uh, uh, when they wouldn't offer me anything, I uh, managed to call a, 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 a legal outfit in uh, in, uh, San, in, in, uh, in San, uh, excuse me, San Francisco, and and I called a couple of them, and one of them turned out to be the biggest and oldest and best, and I can't remember their name at all. I can't remember their name. Maybe I'll think of it later, maybe my wife will, and the attorney who handled it. And they handled it pro bono. And they said, uh, let's, he said, let's get, on a, let's get on a plane and go down to visit Bournes. And I said, what for? And he said, well, we, know, we think we know how to handle this. And apparently, just the sight of this ace big legal outfit in San Francisco caused Bournes to want to settle. Hmm. I'm not going to tell you how much it was, but it was adequate. And 
especially since I knew that the market had crashed. <laughs> and I thought that was a good time to get that money and put, <laughs> and put it in the market like for Intel. Right. So Intel, I think Intel had gone below 10. Mm -hmm. So basically you were getting payment for your share of the company? Is that, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, but, uh, but it was a settlement. We're not, not some rate that they decided on their own. Sure. And, uh, and then I gave him $5,000 even though he didn't ask me for anything. Hmm. Wasn't that interesting? That yeah. <laughs> he just thought it isn't fair what happened to me, you know, that, okay. that I did that for them and, you know. Uh -huh. but, but I had a case if I wanted to make it right. because they, they made us use their, their advertising in Europe. Their, their sales force in Europe only sold little potentiometers, not active circuits. Right. Not even vacuum tubes. And, and I could have gone after them and said, you forced us to use, in Europe, to use the bad marketing, so how could we do as well as we should have been able to do there? And you also made us use your reps in the US. Well, we probably could have gotten better reps. Very likely we'd have won. Anyway, that, that, those attorneys could have turned that trick because people usually would feel sorry for a guy who accomplished all that, and they don't offer him anything. Right. So that's how, that's how generous Borns was. Okay. I can I'm, laugh now because I ended up with quite a bit. I really didn't have to worry about working. Sure, uh, obviously I'd like to hear more about what we did after. So how, what was the eventual um, uh, position of PMI? They were purchased by oh, analog devices? For, for, uh, PM, PM, uh, PMI, Precision Monolithics, well, finally was bought out by, of all things, analog devices, right. the one that I wouldn't sell chips to. Right. In 1990, though, so they, they wow. were still around. So they continued for another they, 15 years. They were still years. around for another 15 years, so obviously right. they had to have done well, very well. Yes, sure. No, they were and they cool. should have. I mean, nobody could touch their products. Right. And then analog devices tried to pretend that in the history of things, they were amongst precision monolithics and others in uh, com competing for that market. Right. If, if you'll sure. pardon the expression, that's okay. BS. Sure. So what did you go on to do, Marv, after you left uh, PMI? Well, after that, I, I invested about two thirds and I invested one third in uh, forming a company to make inventions. Mm -hmm. And I called it A-U-T-E-L, Autel, because it was the invention I first had in mind was a plug-in auto clock that goes into the cigarette lighter socket and has a tap for other things mm -hmm. that we might think of later. So, uh, so I did that, I, I mean, I started to do that and I found an engineer and he bought part of the company and invested his money. And, but uh, it, uh, it took too long to get the auto clock built. And he had an idea for a timer. And I said, yeah, oh, I could sell that timer because I used to feel that, I, that meetings were taking too long. That if you told everybody, and I remember doing that, saying each person at the meeting has like five minutes, up to five minutes. And that way we can get it done in an hour where it was going in like two and a half hours. Yep. Uh, and so I thought with a countdown timer that you could put in, into a standard shirt pocket, just fit. Uh, I, I can show you a picture of it. Sure. Oh, I failed to show you a lot of things that I had here. Uh, I have this with, with uh, this is the 19, uh, this is the picture of precision monolithics that was going to be built up in the hills, like I said, and it uh -huh. shows it up in the hills. Oh, yes. <laughs> Artist's conception. Been, that would have been beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, let's see. Oops. Sorry, I'll get the point. Oops, now I'm all tied up here. I'll Can get you it. grab the I'll stuff get it. from over? Uh, okay, so I'll just flop this on the floor. All right. And then let's see, I wrote down here, this is precision monolithics. Gee, this is, this is something I should have read. This is, this is what really happened. Um, but anyway, the, um, 
Can I read it? Yeah, sure. Go okay. ahead. Okay. I'll show my dulcet eyes. Okay. Precision Monolithics, also known as PMI, was an American company based in, in uh, Santa Clara, California, that developed and produced mixed signal and linear integrated circuits, ICs, parenthesis. It was a, it was a pioneer in the fields, it was the pioneer in the fields of digital to analog uh, converters and operational amplifiers in IC form. The company was founded by, in 69, 1969, by Marv Rudin and Garth Wilson, who had both left Fairchild Semiconductor at the end of 1968. Wilson was circuit design manager uh, under Rudin, who, who managed linear circuit R&D at the Fairchild Semiconductor R&D Laboratory in Palo Alto from 1966 to near the end of 68. At the beginning, Wilson was vice president and responsible for engineering and production. And he reported to Rudin, who was president and marketing manager. Jim Grugan was hired from Fairchild and joined shortly after incorporation as vice president administration responsible for finance, facilities, and purchasing. Immediately after financing and incorporation, they offered founder stock and hired IC designers George Hurdy and from Fairchild and Dan Dooley from TRW Microelectronics. They also hired Jerry Brissy, a chief process engineer from Tektronix, who developed a semiconductor process far superior to what they were able to access from Fairchild R&D processing service department with the exception of nitride passivation for low for, for low noise and uh, technology. Okay, well, I think that gives us a good sense. It was more. known by the founders from Fairchild. In 1969, Dooley designed the first fully integrated D2A converter, the 6-bit DAC-01, using diffused resistors, which can't be trimmed. He recruited his thin film technician with precision resistor fabrication skills that were essential for improving the accuracy of D2A converters, which became the biggest selling type of product to help launch the company. Semiconductor and materials engineer Wadi Cotter was hired with founder stock from Fairchild to support Brissy in both initially, both initially needed for producing high accuracy two-chip D2A converter, high accuracy two-chip D2A converters. PMI pioneered the design and manufacture of the first 10-bit semiconductor IC D2A converter in the market. In March 1970, during the IEEE annual convention in New York, PMI caused a major stir in engineering circles by introducing the AIMDAC 100, the first 10-bit two-chip D2A converter in a dual inline dip semiconductor package. Not only was it for, far more compact and reliable than the modules that were state-of-the-art at, at the time, but it, but, it used, but it was used by JPI at $200 each for their first moon shot, except that was the six-bit one. Hmm. By 1972, Dooley and Brissy, PMI's chief process engineer who developed process uniformity never before seen in the semiconductor industry, continued to design and produce a full 10-bit D2A converter on a, on a single chip, a monodac 2 At that point, PMI 
it's linear process uniformity in products, capitalizing on that uniformity, put PMI in a class by itself. It would be several years before any other company could match the DACO2. Received superior processes and George Erty's outstanding design expertise enabled PMI to establish itself as a superior source of linear amplifiers, including operational amplifiers, some of which garnered U.S. patents by superior layout and circuit design made possible by Brasees and Cotter's process uniformity and techniques. Transistor performance and surface passivation, Erty was able to design and achieve breakthrough advances in micro Must be that one. <laughs> well, that's got the picture on it. Oh, that's the picture. So where's the other? It must be out of order. Okay. Well, I'll just put there because well, it's I, I think we've got a sense of what <laughs> it's what, obvious what, what I'm you accomplished. So. Yeah, we're like that song. You're the tops. <laughs> from the 20s. Good. Right. Okay, so we got there because you were going to show me a picture of the, uh, was it the timer? Or? Yeah, well I, I, I wanted to, uh, I don't know if the camera can zoom in, but this is the, this is what it looked like from the top. And then right on the first two pages, it's emphasizing the AIMDAC 100, AIMDAC 10, sorry, okay. and the DAC 100 both AIM DACs and, and so they're both, oh, oh, the, oh, the AIM DAC 01, sorry, is the 6 bit and okay. the AIM DAC 100 is the 2 chip 10 bit. They were featured in, in 72 and then, hmm. There we go. And then on the next page are Eddie Erdy's outstanding amplifiers. One's called a 725. Yep. Uh, the mono DAC means it's monolithic, one chip. And it's 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 the comp this is the the uh, the comp comparator amplifier. This is the the, the other comparator amplifier, each with different uh, specifications. Here's the 725 SSS, meaning superior second source. We wanted to sell those into where Fairchild had been, had been used, uh, 725 had been used. And the mono op, and the mono op eight, I believe it was the, uh, it was supposed to represent the 108 at, at National that Weidler had done only but do it better. Just like I told Weidler when, I, when he wouldn't cooperate and asked me, tell me what he wanted me, wanted me to do, I said, I'll, I'll do fine without you. And that's what we did. We set out to do so fine without him that his circuits were secondary to the users. <laughs> kind of a nice guy, wasn't I? <laughs> okay. And then here's the uh, Oppo One fast slewing op amp. This, oh, the seven four s secret, the superior second source seven forty one. The well, these are mono chips. That if they tell us what they want, if there are enough of them, <laughs> we're going to make them. Okay. And, and make them better than they could get anywhere else. Okay. Over here is the. Uh, Oh, this is just operational amplifiers in general, and it gives a whole chart with them, with the SSS in front of them. And over here are the are the uh, the modules we began making I that see. John Bowers was able to make. 
And apparently he found out how to make modules, although he didn't come from a modular company, but he knew how to design circuits and he, I guess, I didn't even find out how, he, how they were getting them made, but they were quite compact. And, uh, and one of them is quite noteworthy, a 13-bit D to A converter in a module. And, and here's a very high speed 10-bit converter in a module. And what was the approximate year of this catalog? 72 or oh, so? Oh, so the, some of these were designed in 71. And, and the rest of them were ready in 72. Okay. This, this was the beginning of the year. 71, 72 period. Yeah. These were ready. Yeah. yeah. These were ready in 72. The ones that weren't quite ready at the beginning of the year were the ones on this page. Okay. And they're the ones that show you that there was a 10 bit uh, all diffused single chip called the DACO 2. Right. And, it's, and it says right on it that it's, it'll be released. Um, it's called the the um, wait a minute. okay the mono DACO two and it says leadership products leadership products scheduled for release it says for nineteen seventy two introduction okay and that was done right at the end of last that previous year or at the beginning of this year. Got it. Okay. I and so, and so the other things that were already in here were there in seventy the end of seventy one. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. That's Thank you. That's a good review of the products yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's a then these ads that we ran were brazen ads that said things like, um, uh, how many how many ten bit D to A converters. Uh, I have to read it first. Cost only fifteen ninety five, and give you all this. And then down here it says only one. <laughs> that was my idea. Because you know we we were saying we're unique. If you want a second source, you won't find one. <laughs> and uh, this one said, Precision Monolithics is number one in line in linear IC technology, and then gives the examples of products why we say that here okay and then this one was selling a a mono op 01 and giving for 365 and giving specifications that were you know tremendously good knowing that the designers would compare them and figure out that this was better than they could get anywhere else. And, and then these said, how many precision comparators can match this performance? And it gives the performance and it says only, only one. The, mono, the, the monocomp 01CJ. I guess it was a especially good one. <laughs> Don't remember that. Okay, Mar, I, I think we get the sense here. Could we look at the timer picture you were going okay, to show? Okay, the timer. There? Here's the timer. Actually, that can go fast. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Here's what the timer looked this like. Is the memo time. Yeah, it was a quite a classy looking thing that was designed uh -huh. by a great, great sh shape designer to fit exactly into a standard uh, dress shirt pocket and, and so you could read it on the end right. as you see you, you could read the end of it so you could if they if wore it in your shirt you, you could look, look down, down and see the time. you could look down to see what the time is sure. without anybody noticing hopefully and who were you selling this to two executives at first however the designer of it told me that it would sell to pilots private pilots mm. In, in small air, you know, private aircraft, right? To use as a timer for when they do a countdown before landing. Sure. They have a limited time, and if they don't see the airfield, they're supposed to peel away okay. and try again. Got it. And they call it a countdown timer. Uh -huh. And so this stood out. That red, the, the red LED uh, numbers stood out in the dark, 
and for a, and it was classy for an executive. So for the two uses, we sold some in the Wall Street Journal with ads mm -hmm. to executives, and we sold some in, in engineering in uh, pilots magazines to pilots. Okay, and and. Uh, and it turned out, after we sold a thousand of them, we had to quit because, unfortunately, there was somebody else who was um, who was going to. Uh, um, I was trying to think of that word for for ruining the market for this, namely LCDs. Uh -huh. LCDs use less power, right? And uh, they they could be seen well enough. Sure. So we had to drop it, but it turned out that this product led to another product that turned out to work for, for over, over a decade to come, namely a, a, a pilot called and said that he had an idea for a, a mount for it to put it up on the control yoke instead of down on a pilot's lap. And uh, although the pilot could put this up on the cowl, cowling, but putting it right here, uh, right here was right, right in front of him where he's looking at the instruments and so on. So uh, that worked out great. That, that mount started to sell, gradually sold, but not super high until an electronic navigators came out. And they came out uh, much later. And so it was sort of like a, a small business that I had lots of hobbies then, and and that business we, we were unique in the market with it, and we sold those. And but uh, we had a couple of employees that were part-time students, and uh, uh, we, we got along with that, and we were we assembled them uh, at uh, we got the assembly done by uh, uh, what is it. Uh, um, um, Goodwill, Goodwill. Mm -hmm. They have a place where they manufacture down sure. in San Jose. Yeah, Goodwill industry. So we showed them how to make them, and we got that done. Uh, but we had to we had to stop. But then we did have this other product. Pardon, we did, we had to stop with this. I'm getting confused here. Okay, the other product, the the uh, pilots uh, mount for. Uh, timer, the timer turned out to be great because I had the idea of adding a chart board to it so they could put it, so the pilot didn't have to look at his lap, he, he could look at the chart on his uh, yoke, on his control yoke, and every, so that was a lot safer, he, he could glance up quickly to look at the sky, yeah. and that worked out great over a long time and we got them made, at first we didn't sell huge numbers so we got them made at the Goodwill. And they got so good at it that even later we, we got them at the Goodwill. And, uh, and so there's not much more to say there other than, than uh, our sales ran up to uh, between a half million and a million dollars in the best year. Okay. Uh, and, and they didn't cost much to make, so that was you know, good. Okay, so what did what was the next adventure you were involved in, Marv? After the clamp uh, was yeah. doing very well for you, were, were there other businesses, or were you getting into other activities? I I got into other activities, namely I became active in the Libertarian Party. Okay, I'd been a liber I'd, I'd become a Libertarian in 1980, and and I. Uh, when, when somebody told me that there's a party that believes in freedom of both kinds, um, uh, business and financial and social freedom. And I said, well, I believe that way. I didn't know there was such a party. And he went on and I said, well, wait a minute. There are only about five parties. Two, three of them don't, don't amount to anything. So if I see a party that I like, it's close enough to what I like. <laughs> you don't need to say, tell me more about it. So I joined the party, and the first thing I did, it was right near the elections, 
So I went down and saw, uh, what was it, David Clark? And his name was Clark, his last name, Ed Clark. And he was the candidate that year. And he was at a hotel in Los Angeles in the auditorium. And, and uh, I, I listened to everything they were saying. And then, and then I went out into the lobby. And as they came out, one of the candidates was, uh, was one of the Koch brothers, Charles Koch. And he was running for vice president. And I walked, <laughs> and I walked up to him and I said, keep it simple. I should just tell them they'll have money, they'll have more in their paycheck, <laughs> in their take-home pay, if they if they go libertarian, <laughs> and and then and then and I walked up to to Clark and I said, I said, uh, look at the camera when you're on camera, when when you're on camera, look at the camera, don't look at the audience in the auditorium. So. I said, there's a much, much bigger uh, audience out there than there is in the auditorium. That was good advice. Right. <laughs> uh, but it's, I was kind of, sort of brassy. And, uh, and that's how I got started. So now it was 15 years later, and I'm 70. And, and uh, I'm wondering, what's wrong with this party? They don't seem to grow at all in 15 years. I said, so I gotta find out why. So I'm gonna start going to their meetings. And I learned why. <laughs> but it took me, it took me like several years, about five years to really, I sort of saw why, but I wasn't, I thought, what, surely there's a way for an entrepreneur like myself, which I realized I was by then, having taken such a big chance with PMI. So surely there's somebody like me could get it growing. And so I thought what they need to do is to start doing some clever things, putting ads up like, and I thought of things like uh, buy a uh, used uh, hauling truck, one of those U-Hauls, uh, and put an ad on it that says, a big ad that says uh, li freedom, choose it or lose it, Libertarian Party, and put that truck in a w where a busy thoroughfare can see it, and then keep moving it where other people do it, put it there, and another one, and another one, and another one. So by the end of the year, a whole lot of people have seen that truck once all over the county <laughs> and, and I'll bet that'll cause our our registrations to increase. Mm -hmm. Everybody yawned. <laughs> Just like Bo Marlon Bourne's yawned when I told him we could take over the whole module industry. <laughs> Same thing. They, they couldn't, nobody could see it, not even one person could see that there were things like that we could do that were creative and didn't cost much. <laughs> and I, I could give you more, but mm. I, there's, that's a good example. I looked into radio stations and different things that you could use it cheaply at night and nobody appreciated any of that. It turned out what it was was a club who were critical if anybody wasn't a pure libertarian. <laughs> and they felt proud of themselves because they really knew and it really didn't matter whether we could win win votes even though they ran for office every time some of them did or they got their name on the ballot you know like an ego trip it was for them so uh, so I decided and then one, one other person joined and I thought oh he's gonna be good but then that didn't work so so, I, so anyway, at first I was publicity chair. Then I became chair. I got elected. I got elected publicity chair, then chair. Then I thought, well, I can reach more libertarians by doing the newsletter. So maybe that'll work and I'll get them moving in the direction I want. That didn't work either. 
I, I put out beautiful newsletters and uh, uh, um, every month for about two and a half years. And I could not get even one person to say, yeah, I, I want to join in doing these things, that, these creative things. And all I wanted to do was just meet every once, once a month, and, and there were only like 30 of them out of 600 uh, who, were, who had joined. So there were 600 members locally. 600 non-paying members, about, about uh, 60 dues-paying members, and the most that would show up at a meeting was maybe 10 or 20. <laughs> and I got the biggest meeting they ever had, the uh, biggest output uh, attendance they ever had. Uh, we, we, we were over at Coco's in, uh, Coco's in, in Sunnyvale, I think it is. And uh, we used to meet there and had, a, had the room there, visitor's room, and the way I got the big turnout was I just called all of the paying members <laughs> and invited them to come. And, and uh, there was standing room only. And they said they'd never seen standing room, <laughs> room only before. <laughs> so I realized I'm a different kind of person and it's, nothing's going to move them and I'm wasting my time. <laughs> so I left. You know, I, I never went to any more meetings. But you continue to support their aims? I still am a libertarian because I right. believe in the principles. Right. And uh, I still vote libertarian mm -hmm. because if somebody doesn't vote for them, they won't. They'll go away. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So what else did you do with your time, Marv? You, you, okay. you, you told me you're wearing the well, outfit well, I you're wearing. Well, I always, I go to the, I was going to the gym. I was playing tennis. I was, uh, uh, I think you said he was skiing at one time. Right? I was skiing every winter, yeah. Yeah, I, I taught my son how to ski and we skied and... Uh, you have just the one child? Four children, four but children. one son. Okay. Three and three girls. daughters. Mm -hmm. And I was dancing, by the way, with my daughters at my 90th birthday over at uh, the, the Blue Pheasant. <laughs> At the, the only birthday party I've ever had with my family, by the way, mm. my 90th, I just said, it would be nice to do one when I'm 90. My son fixed it up. Good. He's, he's a board certified uh, surgeon, uh -huh. um, orthopedic surgeon. Okay. And uh, so he fixed it up at there. And anyway, some guys at the bar said, oh, you, you really, you're really popular with the with the girls. <laughs> My daughters are all pretty good, <laughs> but they're in their fifties. You know, okay. they still look pretty good. Good. But and I said, no, no, it's my, it's my ninetieth birthday, and it's my family and and my daughter-in-law, and but it was really funny. He <laughs> said, so, how do you do it with the girls like that? <laughs> well, you've had a lot of interesting experiences throughout your life. Um, if you were advising a young person today in, say, they were studying science and technology, what, what kind of advice would you give them as to how to uh, pursue their career? Well, it depends uh, what ultimate goal they have besides being smarter than everybody and thinking of some coming to find, get, making a discovery that nobody else has thought of. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like that. I, uh, I wasn't raised in a family that exalted pure knowledge. I only went to Caltech because my math teacher kept talking about Caltech and I was, wasn't smart enough and wasn't knowledgeable enough and didn't have good enough advice to know that I might not get in and I'd better go look somewhere else as well. Uh, so, uh, so I went there just to be an engineer, not to be a, sci a physicist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the physicists, I think, were the smartest people technologically or mentally probably the smartest, although it never, it's not always true, but I'm intended to be. And uh, so maybe that's why I got B pluses the rest of my Caltech three years and still was high enough in grade to get into top eight of pi mm -hmm. when as a freshman I, I was a B minus. Uh, like something like 2.75.
And that was probably because I was in with the scientists mm -hmm. as a freshman, mm -hmm. very likely, I think. Or maybe I just got better because my, my high school wasn't as good as the people who were in high schools around the suburbs. Mine was not a, it was kind of a suburb, but, excuse me. Okay. Just back on. All right, well, we've, uh, I think, just about completed the chronology here. Yeah, is about there the only other you'd thing like that, to say before we yeah, about the only other thing that went on is that I, I didn't realize that, that I might make a good manager and a good supervisor. I just wanted to be a, an excellent engineer. But when I found out that I quickly was brought up and people were assigned to me, and then it turned out I'm very good at, uh, I'm not as good as you, I'm, I'm saying, at talking, because my memory is not, is pretty bad. But uh, um, if I have the time, I can write extremely well and say exactly what I want to say mm -hmm. and imagine how people might misunderstand it sure. and make sure those get, are taken out of there. And that's been a big benefit, probably why I got the first day in high school English and, and, and why, like, like as a marketer, I did so well, you know, um, and why as a manager, I did so well. Nobody, nobody left me not knowing what I had to say and, and, and knowing quite well and, 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 and knowing what it was and how we, and, and, and it was easy to remember because I can usually find an easy way to put it into, to capsulize it. Sure. 